Treponema pallidum can be considered a gram-negative bacterium, even though its cell envelope differs from other gram-negative bacteria. You might know T. pallidum because it causes syphilis, a sexually transmitted disease that affects the skin and mucous membranes of the external genitalia, and also sometimes the mouth. Treponema pallidum is an obligate parasite bacteria, meaning it can't survive outside a living body. To be more specific, outside of a human being's body. They belong to a group of bacteria called spirochetes, which are long and thin and contain endoflagella, which are a band of protein filaments that coil within the spirochetes and give them a spiral shape. Kind of like a curly fry, but a little less appetizing. The endoflagella also help the spirochetes to move around by spinning or twisting, a bit like a drill that's slowly boring into a piece of wood. People that have syphilis can transmit the disease to others in one of two ways. The first way is called acquired syphilis, and that's when treponema pallidum enters the body through bodily fluids. That can happen when there are tiny cuts or breaks in the skin or mucous membranes of the external genitalia or mouth and when there's sexual contact, including oral, anal, and vaginal sex. It can also happen when people share contaminated needles, or when they have direct contact with a skin lesion on an infected person, because the skin lesion is covered in this fluid which is rich in spirochetes. The second way is called congenital syphilis, and that's when a pregnant person has syphilis and treponema pallidum infects a baby either in the uterus or while the baby exits through the vagina at birth. In acquired syphilis, there are three stages to the infection. The first stage is called primary syphilis, or the early localized stage, and it usually starts one to three weeks after the T. pallidum lands on the skin or mucous membrane. During this stage, the spirochetes destroy the soft tissue and skin wherever they enter the body, and that results in the formation of ulcers called syphilitic chancres. A syphilitic chancre is painless, and you can remember that by dropping in a U to make it chancure, like you're cured of the pain. These chancres have a hard base, raised borders, and are usually covered by a fluid rich in spirochetes, and this can spread to other parts of the body as well as to other individuals. In individuals who acquire syphilis through sexual contact, the primary chancre develops around the external genitalia. However, for individuals that acquire syphilis by physically touching a person, or in some other way, the primary chancre might appear on the hands or some other part of the body. Syphilitic chancres typically heal on their own over a few months, but during that time, some spirochetes go to nearby lymph nodes where they cause lymphadenopathy, which is lymph node enlargement, and then they get into the lymph and finally into the bloodstream. If syphilis is acquired through something like a blood transfusion, then there may not be any early localized stage at all, and no primary chancre. The second stage is secondary syphilis, or the dissemination stage, and it occurs about 6 to 12 weeks after the infection. During this stage, spirochetes enter the bloodstream, which is called spirochetemia, and this causes generalized lymphadenopathy, which is when spirochetes can be found in lymph nodes throughout the body. The spirochetes like to attach to and infect endothelial cells in small capillaries near the skin. This causes a non-itchy maculopapular rash, which are small bumps that are either flat or raised. The rash starts on the trunk and spreads out to the arms and legs, and eventually to the palms, soles, genitalia, and other mucous membranes. These rashes can sometimes be pustular, which means they're filled with the white fluid pus, or they can be papulosquamous, which is when they're really scaly and hard. In addition, there can be something called condylomalata, which are smooth, white, painless, wart-like lesions, and they appear on moist areas like the genitals, around the anal region, and in the armpits. So, these various rashes can erupt all over the body, and the lesions are chock-full of spirochetes, making secondary syphilis the most infectious stage. The rashes from secondary syphilis usually resolve within a few weeks to months. After secondary syphilis is a latent phase, called latent syphilis. 
This is when the disease enters a dormant or asymptomatic phase. During this phase, the spirochetes can mostly be found in the tiny capillaries of various body organs and tissues. Latent syphilis can be further divided into an early phase and a late phase. Early latent syphilis occurs within a year of infection, and during that time, the spirochetes can re-enter the blood. So, this means that during early latent syphilis, they can still be found circulating in large numbers in the blood, causing symptoms of secondary syphilis. However, the late latent phase is generally after a year, and that's because the spirochetes generally stay within the tiny capillaries of various body organs and tissues. As it turns out, only a few spirochetes are actually found in the capillaries of tissues and organs. But there's a severe immune response, so severe that it causes tremendous damage to the cells there. And that triggers the next phase, which is tertiary syphilis. In tertiary syphilis, there's a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, which means that there's an immune response that's mainly led by the T cells, and they recruit phagocytes like macrophages, and cause the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as tumor necrosis factor, IL-1, and IL-6. All of this leads to local swelling or edema, redness and warmth, as well as systemic symptoms like a fever. T. pallidum has three main antigens. These include group-specific antigen, which are present in all treponemes, species-specific antigen, which are specific to T. pallidum, and cardiolipin, which is a lipid antigen, which interestingly is present within the spirochetes as well as the cells in our body. Now, plasma cells like to get themselves involved in the immune reaction by producing antibodies against these antigens. In some cases, the immune cells start to huddle around and form a granulomatous lesion called a gumma, and this has lots of different types of immune cells that get surrounded by an outermost layer of fibroblasts. Often, funnily enough, there aren't any spirochetes at all in these lesions. It's just like the immune cells are getting overexcited and huddling up for no obvious reason. The tissue at the center of the gumma often ends up without oxygen, and that can lead to a coagulative necrosis. In tertiary syphilis, various organs get damaged, like the heart and blood vessels, which is called cardiovascular syphilis, the brain and the spinal cord, called neurosyphilis, and also the liver, joints, and testes, which haven't yet earned their own special names. In cardiovascular syphilis, there's endarteritis, which is inflammation of the tiny arterioles called vasa vasorum, which supply blood to large arteries like the aorta. The result is that parts of the aorta are damaged, resulting in aortitis, or inflammation of the aorta, and this can cause aortic aneurysms. In neurosyphilis, the spirochetes set up camp in the capillaries supplying the posterior or back part of the spinal cord, and this can result in something called tabes dorsalis, which literally translates as wasting or loss of the back of the spinal cord. The protective sheath which covers the nerves running along the back of the spinal cord is damaged, and this results in a loss of vibration sensation and a loss of proprioception which is the sense of position of the joints and other body parts, like the hands and the feet. So that's what happens when syphilis damages the posterior spinal cord. But sometimes the spirochetes invade the capillaries supplying the anterior or front of the spinal cord, and that results in general paresis, which causes loss of sensation and weakness, or sometimes even paralysis, mostly in the legs. If spirochetes get into the capillaries serving the brain, then that can cause slurred speech, altered behavior, memory loss, difficulty coordinating muscle movements, and even paralysis. Syphilis can even affect the eye, causing argyle robertson pupil, which is when the pupil loses its light reflex, but it does still have its accommodation reflex, which means that the pupil constricts when there's a nearby object. It just doesn't do anything when it's too light. In congenital syphilis, the spirochetes can infect the baby either via the placenta or during childbirth in the birth canal. In early disease, which is in the first two years, the result can range from a baby being stillborn or dying within the womb to having classic features like a maculopapular rash of the palms and soles of the feet, 
and snuffles, which is when the nose is blocked by increased secretions, which contain spirochetes. Babies may also have organ damage to the liver and spleen, causing hepatosplenomegaly, and damage to the eyes as well, like optic neuritis. In late disease, which is after a child is two years old, classic features often include a saddle nose, which is a bony destruction of the nose, saber shins, which is when the tibia gets bent, Hutchinson teeth, which is when the teeth develop little notches, and hearing loss. Diagnosis of acquired syphilis starts with identifying spirochetes in the fluid from Shankers, and this can be done using dark field microscopy. A dark field microscope shines thin slivers of light on a slide so that the background appears dark, while the extremely thin spirochetes light up. You know how we can see dust particles better in a dark room and there's just a stream of light shining through the door? It's kind of like that. Now, the diagnosis is confirmed with serological tests, and these look for antibodies against the T pallidum antigens. There are non-treponemal tests, like the Rapid Plasma Reagent Test, or RPR, and the Venereal Disease Research Laboratory Test, or VDRL, as well as tests that detect anticardiolipin antibodies called reagent in the blood. The key, though, is that these are not specific to syphilis. For example, cardiolipin is also released by damaged cells in our body. Then, we have the treponemal tests, which include T. pallidum particle agglutination, or TPPA, and fluorescent treponemal antibody absorbed, or FTA-ABS. These treponemal tests detect antibodies that target T. pallidum. Diagnosing congenital syphilis, as you might imagine, is a bit different. In congenital syphilis, the diagnosis involves looking at the mother's and the baby's results in parallel. For example, if a baby's non-treponemal serologic titer is four times greater than the mother's titer, like if the baby's RPR is 1 to 64 and the mother's is 1 to 16, then that suggests that the baby has congenital syphilis. In general, for any baby whose mother was inadequately treated for syphilis or is suspected of having congenital syphilis for a different reason, it's helpful to get CSF fluid for VDRL, as well as cell counts and protein. It's also helpful to perform long bone x-rays, as well as an eye exam and a hearing screen. The main treatment for syphilis is penicillin, but in some cases doxycycline can be used as well. When using penicillin though, it's important to watch out for a yarish herxheimer reaction, which is when spirochetes die and break open, releasing a lot of antigens all at once, and making the immune system go into overdrive. When that happens, it results in sudden fevers, sweating, and muscle and joint pains that may last for a few hours up to a few days. Alright, as a quick recap. So, syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease, and it's caused by the spirochete called treponema pallidum. It can cause disease in three stages. The first is localized primary syphilis, and this produces hard chancres. The second is disseminated secondary syphilis, which produces widespread maculopapular rash. And the third is systemic tertiary syphilis, and that affects various organs. Syphilis can be diagnosed by using serological tests and treated with antibiotics like penicillin.